Hi friends, good morning, great to see you, welcome to church, fantastic to see you, thanks Brian for leading, uh, thanks very much Liz for leading. Uh, welcome people here in person, welcome online. Uh, friends, I said I'd take questions after this section, we've been working through 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, five talks, a big section, all about life in God's church together, uh, how we meet together, what we do when we meet together, Another section, uh, questions afterwards. Uh, you may have questions particularly from this passage, uh, hold on to them. Uh, I think your questions will probably be our questions, so it would really help to ask them. Uh, hold on to them, we've allowed time for that. I look forward to that. Uh, friends, I wonder if you've um, listened to our parliament leaders uh, at what's called question time. It's when they debate and discuss the issues of the land. Uh, our, our parliamentary leaders uh, talk, debate, question each other, discuss. And you can listen to it on the radio during the week. Maybe uh, some of you have listened to this. What is one of the most common things you will hear if you listen to our national news? You'll hear the speaker, the leader of the house, say this, order, order, order in the house. The speaker is trying to calm things down, settle things down, because so often there is disorder. There's disorder, there's chaos. People are speaking over the top of each other. People are interrupting each other. People are mocking each other. And it can feel like a circus. It can seem out of control. It seems to me that the speaker or leader of the House of Parliament has a very tough job trying to keep order in a disordered meeting. Now, that's our parliament. Thankfully, that is not our church, is it? We don't expect that. We seem to have a basic order to what we do on a Sunday morning uh, and in our growth teams. Uh, we let people take it in turns. We've done that so far, haven't we? Uh, Brian has spoken and Liz has spoken and I'm speaking. We don't tend to interrupt and that's exactly how it should be. But it wasn't like this for the Corinthians. It seems that in the church in Corinth, people thought that if you had a spiritual gift, you had to use it. You had the right to use it then and there. If you had something to say, you had the right to say it, even the duty to say it then and there. Even if someone else was speaking. That was the culture. The picture that emerges of this church in Corinth is a bit like our national parliament when it gets out of control. And this section is the Apostle Paul saying to the church in Corinth, ah, order in the house, order in God's house, order in the church. That is what the section is about, friends. Like Brian said, last week was all about clarity in the church, or intelligibility, understanding what we say when we that's important. This week, it's all about order, order in the church. Let's pray, friends, and then we'll look at it together. Father God, again, we thank you that you speak to us about how to meet together as your people. We want to learn from you how to do that. Help us to listen, we pray, to listen humbly, to learn from you, how to order our church and Bible study meetings, that we may honour you and best hear your most precious word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. ...is important. Paul will show that. But first, friends, he reminds the Corinthians of the goal of order in the church meetings. It's not order for the sake of order. It's that the church might be built up. And that's been Paul's goal all through this section, chapters 12 to 14. You see it again in verse 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Paul is talking about our meetings, church, Bible studies, home groups, because he says, when they come together. Right? That's what this is about, the, the public gatherings, that is church. 
And when that, when that happens, Paul expects a number of different speaking ministries to be taking place, hymns, revelation, instruction. And this is us in our church meetings, isn't it, friends? We speak Christian truth in all sorts of different ways. When we gather, uh, already this morning we've begun this, we've heard God's word sung as our music team have, have led us. We've heard God's word read. We're hearing God's word taught. Some of us have been speaking God's word in our conversations as we've arrived at church. There's a variety of ways in which we speak and hear God's word, and, and this enriches us. This is wonderful. Paul reminds the Corinthians of the purpose behind it. It's that we might be built up, that the church might be built strong. That's the purpose, friends. Remember? It seems like the Corinthians were speaking whenever they wanted for their sake, that they might be heard. Any individual would jump and interrupt and speak. But that's not the way of love, and that doesn't best the church. That's Paul's big point, friends. Love drives us to God's church. That's been his point all through these chapters. Same with here. So remembering that principle, how do we order our church meetings so that we might be built up in love? The first area Paul speaks about is tongues, speaking other languages, a practice that the Corinthians celebrated. They thought it was a sign of their spiritual maturity that people would stand up and speak in a language that no one could understand. Some of you may have experienced this in church. Uh, some of you may have visited a Pentecostal church and seen this very practice. I have. When I was younger, I remember attending a Pentecostal church in Sydney. I was really young, 14 or something, uh, pretty new to church, and a friend took me along. And there was a lot of people speaking in tongues in this church meeting. The pastor himself up the front was praying in a tongue, a language that no one understood, it would seem. Uh, he was praying into the microphone for a long period of time in this tongue. Uh, people around me were speaking in different tongues or praying in different tongues. Music was playing in the background at the same time. And it was total chaos. I had no idea what was going on. And I didn't understand a thing. It was a bit like question time in our national parliament. There was no order in that house. But Paul says that's not how the gift of tongues is ever to be exercised. It's not to be used like that in church. And Paul puts some very tight restrictions on it. And they're crystal clear. 27 and 28, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Three restrictions, very clear only two or three. Right? This could go on. Paul understands that. Two or three at the most. Secondly, one at a time. Take it in turns. Thirdly, only if there is interpretation. Let me be crystal clear. I think I said it last week. Absolutely no place for interpreted tongues in God's church. The Bible is crystal clear. If there's no interpretation, tongues aren't for church. They're for private use at home. They're between you and God. No place in the public meeting. Paul comes to prophecy. Prophecy. Prophecy is a big and broad word. It seems to mean the speaking of the word of God intelligibly for the building up of others. That's what it seems to mean. Paul comes pretty close to a definition earlier in chapter 14, verse 3. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. But with prophecy as well, there is to be order. Uh, from verse 29, two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker 
should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Again, friends, there needs to be order. The limited number uh, of people who can speak. Paul seems to know that our capacity to listen is limited. Remember again, the Corinthians seem to think that if you could speak, you should, you must. If you did have the gift of prophecy, you had to use it. That was their view, and so they did. But no, says Paul, two or three. They're to take it in turns. We know that the Spirit of God empowers uh, God's gifts, empowers people to use God's given gifts in the church. But that doesn't mean you are out of control as you exercise some God-given gift. See, you may be able to speak some message, some prophecy, some word of encouragement by God's Spirit, but you are in control of how you do that and of when you do that. Remember, friends, part of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is self-control. Living by the Spirit doesn't mean you're out of control. And Paul says the same thing here, verse 32, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So you may have some prophetic wisdom given by God. That doesn't mean you can say it whenever you want. It doesn't mean you can interrupt whoever is speaking in in church or in your growth team. If you do speak, you will wait your turn. That's the simple idea, friends, in this little section. Paul is applying traffic lights to uh, these church meetings because traffic lights just give order to our driving, don't they? If uh, you have a, a green light, I have a red light. They just help us to take it in turns, which we need, don't we? You know when there's a blackout and you come to traffic lights and no one knows what to do. It's chaos and it's dangerous, isn't it? And people are pushing in front of each other. Paul is applying some traffic lights to life in church and to life in growth teams. Take it in turns. Just because I can speak doesn't mean I will. And if you're speaking, stay silent. I will wait my turn. See, God wants our meetings to be times of peace and of order, not chaos, not anxiety, conflict, not interruptions and not rudeness. None of those things rightly represent God. God is a God not of disorder, but of peace, of love. So we must uh, order, structure our church meetings in light of our God. Now, so far, friends, I expect nothing seems too controversial. It seems that our practices in our church beautifully reflect the teaching this passage. I think we would agree. Uh, you can, you can uh, ask a question in question time if, if there is something controversial so far. It seems to me that we would nod so far. The next part might seem more controversial. Uh, this next little section. On first reading, it seems that Paul is telling women to be silent in the church, always. You will notice that a woman has just read the Bible for us. Have we disobeyed the very word as we've read it? What is Paul saying here? What is going on in this little section? Let's look at it, friends. Let's look at it together from verse 33b. As in all the congregations of the Lord's people, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. Want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. All sorts of questions may come to mind here, friends. How far do we take this? Are women literally never to speak in church? Is it just up the front that women aren't to speak? Some churches in our diocese have this practice. And women are never up the front. They, they never lead in prayer or read the Bible, as, as is our practice. Are women to be silent through the rest of the meeting as well? 
the, the, the more informal parts of the meeting, uh, morning tea, uh, supper, th- this is a part of church. What is Paul saying? We want to try to figure it out, friends. God's word is always for our best. It always brings blessing, uh, including the hard parts. This is a hard part of God's word. Uh, Don Carson, who, who is possibly the uh, world-leading New Testament scholar, says of this passage that it is extremely difficult to know what is being said. So it's a tough passage. But it doesn't mean we give up, friends. We just work a bit harder. What is going on? Well, first, friends, this command for women to be silent in church cannot be an absolute thing. It cannot be meant absolutely. We know this because just one or two pages back in chapter 11, Paul expects women to be prophesying in church, to be praying and prophesying out loud publicly in church. He's just been talking about that. In chapter 11, he's dealing with a different issue. It's the issue of men and women expressing their God-given gender. simple point there is that Men are to dress and look like men, and women are to dress and look like women. And as they do, men and women are to pray and prophesy in church. We know from Acts that when the Spirit of God is poured out on God's people, all would prophesy. Men and women, all would speak God's truth. So Paul cannot mean that women are to be silent in church, always, absolutely. He can't mean that. So we've got to look, we've got to look closer. We've got to look, uh, work harder. And when we do, we see that Paul's been talking about something else as well. He's been talking about the weighing of prophecy. Just a little bit earlier, verse 29. Did you see it, friends? Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. You see, not everything that is said in church or in a growth team is right. It needs to be weighed. That is, it needs to be tested against Scripture. And we know from elsewhere in the New Testament that God appoints leaders who are responsible for the teaching of God's people in church, or if you like, the weighing of prophecy. And these are to be men. That is what Paul is referring to here, the weighing of prophecy. That is a role for men, for the teaching elders of the church. Now, how do we express this in our church? Well, you'll know that one of our practices is that preaching and church meeting leading and growth leading, where where there are mixed groups, These are roles that we give to men. See, all of them involve some sort of weighing of prophecy, don't they? If there's a question time after the sermon, the preacher will respond and and accept some ideas and perhaps challenge ideas before bringing the teaching to a conclusion. There is a weighing of the contributions. In in the church meeting that, that, that Brian is leading so well at the moment, there's often a a weighing of the ideas as some sort of summary statement is made at the end. Same with a growth team. In a growth team, there'll be a whole lot of input, a whole lot of prophecy, won't there? Ideas, contributions, people speaking from the Word of God. But there's also a weighing of prophecy, some sort of summary, some sort of direction of the group as a whole as the leader seeks to bring contributions under the word of God. This is the weighing of prophecy. And again, from here and from elsewhere in the Bible, this is the responsibility of men. Paul is very clear that this is not because this was the culture of the day. That is one way you can read this passage. You can say Paul is just outdated. We've moved on. But, but no, Paul refers in verse 34 to the law. The law, that is God's instruction, God's word in the Old Testament. Paul is almost definitely thinking of Genesis 2, where we see that man is made first with a responsibility to serve God, and then woman is made as his helper. 
And Paul teaches elsewhere that a pattern is established here. That there is an order between the sexes that is not cultural, it is created. Men and women are given different roles in the home and in the church. And that expresses itself, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, as men being responsible for the weighing of prophecy. Friends, women have a vital role in prophecy in our church. A vital role in contributing ideas in our public meetings, uh, leading in prayer and prophecy up the front, uh, speaking up in growth teams and contributing and helping. All sorts of ways in which women are involved in prayer and prophecy in the life of our church, which is thoroughly biblical. But the weighing of prophecy is for men. Sometimes with God's word, you see it clearly in your experience. And I remember one time when I was younger, seeing this passage disobeyed. I don't think I'd even read the passage. I don't think I even knew it was in the Bible. But I knew that something was happening that was wrong. I was at a Christian camp. It's about 20 years ago now. And somebody preached. And they preached a fantastic sermon that built the church. There was a question time after the sermon. There was an older woman sitting next to her husband who asked a question, but she asked one of those questions that really wasn't a question. She was attacking the preacher. She wasn't asking to learn uh, and to grow or to help the church. She was attacking the teaching and the teacher who had just taught. See, again, I, do, I wasn't even aware of this passage, but I knew that something wrong was taking place. She was prophesying. She was weighing in on prophecy. And it was clearly wrong. It was dishonouring. It was dishonouring of the preacher. It was dishonouring to her husband, who was sitting next to her, somewhat embarrassed. And it was dishonouring to herself. See, once again, friends, Paul is concerned for order. Order between the sexes. And Paul is concerned that God's given order be rightly expressed in the life of our church when it comes to the weighing of prophecy. Finally, friends, be an order under the authority of the apostles. Verse 37 is the key. If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, says Paul, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. Paul saying, you may presume to, to speak God's truth as prophets. You may think that you are spiritual, but I have a higher authority. What I say is the Lord's command, the command of Jesus. Paul is speaking as an apostle. He's part of that select group that witnessed the risen Christ and was commissioned by Christ to bring his word. And Paul is saying that apostolic authority trumps prophecy. What does all this mean for us, friends? It's very simple. Bible first. That's what it means for us. Bible first. Bible wins. God's ideas ahead of our ideas. That is what Paul is saying. And in the context of this passage, what it means is that these things really matter. This teaching about church order and church practice it's not about individual preference or, or background. Friends, we do these things not because we're Anglican, not because our leaders, uh, Lucy, you and I, went to Moore College, and that's what Moore College does. us. No, friends. It's because this is how God orders his church, as commanded by Christ, through Christ's apostles. So this is crucial we mustn't ignore these things, verse 38, or we ourselves will be ignored. Verses 39 and 40 conclude the section as I conclude this sermon. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Order matters. Again, not just order for the sake of order, 
is that there might be the clearest possible speaking and hearing of the word of Christ in love so that God's church might be built strong. That is why order matters. It's because this gospel word is so precious. It's our life. It's our hope. It's the word of the cross of Christ that brings the forgiveness for our sins that we desperately need. It's the word that encourages us to keep living for the risen Lord Jesus who lived and bled and died for us. We must keep hearing this word. That's why our communication in church must be clear and ordered. So, friends, when there's disorder in our House of Parliament, it might be frustrating, certainly entertaining. But, friends, if there is disorder in God's house, in God's church, that is tragic and wrong because our message is way too important and God's church is way too important. We will pray, but first... What questions do you have, friends? Take a moment. Have a look over the passage. Have a look over any notes you've taken. Do you have any questions from this passage? As you're thinking, uh, let me tell you about something that we'll do in just a moment. Uh, after question time, Lucy is going to jump forward and tell us about a book that she and some other women have found helpful, or men, sorry, not just women, women and men, including this man, have found incredibly helpful on these questions. Uh, Lucy's going to tell us about that book in just a moment. And we have copies of this book for you today. I think there are eight copies left. Uh, but I'll leave that to Lucy. That's coming in a second. Any questions, friends? Any questions from this passage or elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14? Alan, kick us off. Thanks. Que that's a question, Alan? I'll repeat it. The question is, in this context, does prophecy mean speaking forth God's word, speaking from God's word, or does it mean foretelling the future? Fabulous question. Thank you for the question. And I'm sure, again, a lot of us have that question, and, we, and other people have asked me that question. Um, it's the first one. It's the first one, Alan. Absolutely brilliant question. But in this context, that is what it means. It does not mean foretelling the future. It does not mean predicting what is to come. Um, it can mean that. It can include that. For example, uh, let me predict the future. Christ is coming soon. Right? That, is, that, is, that is foretelling the future. We know that certainly from the word of God. Right? So that's, that's, that's prophecy. That is also foretelling the future. So some prophecy will include uh, truth of the future, foretelling the future, which we know for sure from the word of God. But no, the word is not just used, it used in that limited sense in this section. It is all about speaking the word of God to one another in all sorts of ways. Uh, for our mutual upbuilding. Uh, a very broad, general word, and again, uh, to be clear, I think Paul expects everyone to be doing it, men and women, but again, to be clear, the praying of prophecy he reserves for men. Thanks, Alan. Great question. Other questions? Friends, Kev. Um, what are some ways we can apply that verse? The speaking of tongues in church. Uh, to ourselves, to ourselves, because obviously we speak styles and speaking styles of God. Um, what, what does it look like for us to do that? Okay, no, sorry, let me be clear again, friends. Thanks, Kev. The question is from verse 28 um, about speaking tongues. Um, and the verse says that if there's no interpretation, the person should stay silent um, and speak to themselves uh, and to God. And Kev's asking about that. What does that look like and what does that look like in church? Thank you, Kev. Thank you for the question. Uh, I expect that Paul doesn't mean that the person does that in church. They don't speak to uh, themselves and to God in church. I think the message is that's for, that's for when they go home. Uh, that is, if somebody has the gift of tongues but not the gift of interpretation or there's no one in church to interpret that language... Um, again, there is no place for that in the public meeting of the church or in a Bible study group. Okay, No place for um, a, a language to, to be used that nobody else understands, including the very speaker. Right? 
reserve that for use at home. So thank you, Kev, but I don't think the meaning is uh, people with that gift uh, sort of operate with that gift in church. Uh, I think just looking at the message of the whole section, Paul is talking about what happens in church. Uh, we know that from verse 26 when he says, when you come together. Uh, that's, that's what he's thinking about. And the overarching message is, from, it's really chapter 13, all things are to be done in love. In love, we look to the other. We look to each other. We want to build the church. And it's clear, intellig intelligible words, prophecy, that build the church. So that's the big message, friends. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's for, for, for those who have that gift for home use. Will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, great question, Will. So what does Paul mean exactly? Um, I think you gave two possibilities. Sorry, the question, just for people at home who haven't heard that, Will asked, um, does Paul mean some heavenly uh, language, um, some spiritual language, heavenly language, does Paul mean another, another human language um, because he talks about interpretation? Um, I'm not too sure I think he could mean either uh, when he talks about tongues. Um, from the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul um, says, if I speak the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong, and, and on he goes. Uh, I expect that these languages could be the languages of people, uh, foreign languages, unknown to the speaker and to the hearers, uh, or they could be heavenly languages, some sort of angel. Either way, a couple of things to say. They are real languages with real meaning because they can really be interpreted. That is, it's not just sort of babbling noise in Paul's mind. Okay, It's not just kind of babbling sounds that have no meaning. No, no. Gift um, is, is, is a, the gift of speaking some real language that has some real meaning. Um, that's what Paul's talking about. That meaning cannot be discerned interpretation in church, it has no place. So it's a, it's a very tight restriction, a very clear restriction that we must hear. Because again, love demands that we look to each other and seek to build God's church through the speaking of the gospel. Um, great question, Will. Russell. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So uh, Russell's referring to Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost when the Spirit falls upon the believers in the church and people do speak in tongues, other languages, and other people gather there, hear what is going on. Something a bit different is going on there to this problematic practice in Corinth, it, it would seem, because there, the people who are gathered hear the praises of God in their own language. I talked, I talked last week about how clarity is a blessing. Uh, that was happening on the day of Pentecost. Uh, people heard the praises of God being told in their own language. Um, what the Corinthians were doing was all about confusion. Nobody understood what was going on, and so no one was being built up. Hence Paul's rebuke. Um, thanks, Russell. Kate. Um, yeah. Great question, Kay. The question is, um, from the section about women, it seems to be talking about married women. Um, yes, thank you, it does. Uh, let, let, let the wife ask her husband at home, and Kate's question is, how might this apply for single women? Fantastic question, Kay. Great question. So, Kate, notice the spirit behind Kate's question. All of us can be encouraged by this, friends. What she's, with that question, what she's doing is saying, how can we obey God's word as much as possible? We can do that. We can have the other spirit sometimes with the Bible. I can have this problem. How can I, you know, disobey this as much as possible? How can I get away with obeying this as little as possible? Whereas Kate is, is thinking, I'm a single woman, um, but I still seek to obey God's truth. So I, I encourage you and you, Kate, on your godly posture before the Word of God. Maybe all be encouraged by that and uh, seek to follow that. 
Um, it's tough because in the Greek, it's the same word for woman and wife, okay? One word. <laughs> so the people who find this passage difficult, everyone, <laughs> asks this question, what does Paul mean? Is he talking about a wife? Uh, it, would, it would seem to when, when, when he talks about asking her husband at home. Um, but it would also seem that the um, teaching isn't just restricted to wives. It would, it would seem that way. Uh, that is this restriction on today's prophecy um, is, is a restriction for men. That's it's, a, it's limited to men. Um, uh, yeah, I I think what we want to do is men and women is is really what you're doing with this question, Kate. I'm not going to come up with a, three things to do or five things to do. I'm just really going to commend the question. I think we all want to do this as men and women. We want to do this together. How can we honor God and love and serve each other as that God has created us to be. Uh, there's different roles that God has given to men to women. I just really want to commend the question and, and encourage all of us to think like that. Uh, for the men amongst us, what does it mean to be men in God's church? Kate's asking as a woman, can I encourage the men? What does it mean to be men in God's house? You'll see from this passage, friends, we have a special role, brothers. We have a role to take responsibility for the teaching of God's word. In, in the gathering of God's people. We have a responsibility to lead as teachers of God's word in our homes. Men, how are we doing that? How are we following Christ in, in, in leading through the word of God in our church and in our home? Um, men are doing this in all sorts of ways in our church, but I, I think it's the right question to ask for men, asking the right question to ask for women. How can we honour God? I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to encourage the question. Uh, well done. I probably need to stop. What's the time, Brian? Is it, do, I, do I need to... 10 to 11. Oh, I've got one or two more if there are questions. I think 10 to 11, we're okay. Yeah, Sarah, one or two more. Uh, you just mentioned in chapter 11. Uh, yep. Yes. Yes. So in 29, he's one of the two or three prophets who are allowed to speak. Able to yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's talking, about, that's talking about prophesying generally in church. Um, so Sarah's talking about verse 29 again to repeat the question. The question was... Um, Yes, about, about women. Uh, yeah, verse 29, two or three prophets should speak. Um, uh, Sarah is asking, can one of them, both of them be women? Um, yes, absolutely, right? Absolutely. This is the prophesying in the public meeting. A couple of things to say about that. That number is not, not tightly restricted like the number of tongues speakers is. It's tighter with the tongue speakers. Paul says two or three. Um, yeah, there's not that sort of restriction here. That is, think of a growth team, or think of our question time like this now. We, we, we've had more than two or three. That's absolutely fine. That's fantastic. Uh, we're not out of line with that two or three there. It's not two or three only. Um, uh, and yes, absolutely, that, that can be women. It is to be women. Paul expects it would be women. So thank you, women who are engaging in prophecy in this very conversation. Thank you for women who are part of growth teams and are, and are engaged in prophecy in growth teams and, and, and men who do this in all sorts of ways. Abs absolutely, absolutely, yep. I think that's in line with what Paul expects back, back in chapter 11. He just expects women to be praying and prophesying in church. Um, so yeah, thanks, great question. Any others, friends? Yeah, Pung. Yes, I think so. The question from Pung is, uh, the, the, the people who are weighing prophecy, Paul says that's not a role for women, it's for the men. Um, and then Pung is asking, is this a role for elders in the church? Um, yeah, I think that is right. I think that is right. Um, sort of teaching elders and pastors in the church, um, which then begs the question, who exactly are they? <laughs> you know, the, and it's not easy to answer that question. Um, in our church, um, and I think, I think this is right biblically as we seek our ability to, to follow biblical direction, um, yeah, growth team leaders and, and teaching pastors uh, fit that role of being elders, teaching elders. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Bible talks about teaching elders in passages like 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, 1 Peter 5. Um, but this isn't limited to the 
pastors of our church. I think this certainly includes our growth team leaders um, who are to be men, and that's our practice based on passages like this, involved in the weighing of prophecy. Does that answer the question? Thanks, Bung. Okay, Lucy, why don't you come forward? Thanks very much. Thanks, friends. You may well have more questions to help each other. And feel free to come to me uh, or, to, or to others with your, with your questions. Uh, okay, Lucy's going to tell us about a book. And then after that, I'll, I'll close in prayer. So I'll stay here. I'm going to pray in a second. Thanks, Lucy. I really commend. Uh, there are a lot Just hold of really close. questions <laughs> and thoughts that we have. And that's really good. It's a really challenging and hard passage. And I think it's not just hard because the text is hard. It's because, um, yeah, it's, we are so... Our culture tells us how to be men and women living together. Uh, but really, we need God's word to tell us how we can be men and women together in our church gatherings, but also in our homes, isn't it? Can I commend this book? It's called God's Good Design by Claire Smith. There are lots of books about how men and women should live together in church and in our homes. But I love this book uh, because Claire really goes through all the um, biblical passages and um, does a dig dive verse by verse and even word to word on what certain words mean. Uh, she gives us different interpretations, but she comes to a conclusion about what she thinks um, God is saying from those passages. And so the Bible, uh, this book is titled God's Good Design and it's called What Bible really says about men and women. And as Tim preached, um, it's, it, it's a great joy for us to know how we relate to each other in church and in our homes uh, because we want to testify to the world the beauty of God's design. Um, when I was single and at Bible college, I read this book because uh, I had a few questions. At college, we had preaching groups where we learn how to share God's word and for us, that was a mixed group. And so what does that look like? Um, should I get up and um, have this training opportunity uh, to teach God's word and learn how to teach God's word? What would that look like for the men in my group? Uh, how do I think through that? How, how does God's word inform how I practice there? Uh, now, as a married woman uh, to Andrew, uh, we're learning together of how do we lead growth teams together? Um, how, what does that look like for me to be a woman in that context? What are, what are the opportunities that I can have to encourage and to prophesy? I think especially for us women, this book really helped me to see 1 Timothy 2, uh, the common passage, Bible passage that we hear of I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority um, in, um, over men. But what I missed before reading Claire's book was um, verse 11 was verse 12. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 11 was the huge encouragement for women to let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And I missed that. I kept looking at the restriction, but the, not the opportunity that God had given me to learn and actively learn God's word. Um, and that was really cool and a reminder for me of the joy to actively learn from the men God has placed in my life and how to do that well. So really commend this book. Hugh has a few copies, eight copies left. They're $20 each. Yeah, read it with someone else. There's discussion guides at the back. Um, really helpful to, for us to discuss it as a what that looks like uh, as we practice and do church life together, but also in our homes, what does that look like? Thanks, Lucy. Fantastic. Um, again, I commend the book. It's brilliant, really helpful to me. We're going to pray, friends. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we praise you. We praise you that you are a God not of disorder but of peace. Uh, we thank you so much again that you speak to us clearly about our church and home group meetings in passages like this. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, so much for the gifts that you give to each one of us as your people. Praise you for that teaching through this passage that not one of us has missed out but that we are all gifted by you for the common good. And Father, we praise you for that. Uh, Father, we do pray that we would all grow in love and in love, uh, seek to do all that we can to build each other up uh, in our knowledge of you. Uh, we thank you for our church and home group meetings and the blessing they are to us. May we continue to be built up together in our precious faith in Christ, we pray. Help us to continue to rightly order our practices uh, under your instruction uh, given um, through your apostle Paul in this passage. 
And as we live together in this way, we pray that we would be blessed together. We thank you again that you have made us uh, male and female and for the blessing that that is in these different roles that we have together in the life of our church. And again, may we honour you as the men and the women that we are. So Father, we thank you for your goodness to us uh, and the joy of being gathered in your church together. We commit our church and all of our groups to you. May we honour your name in the way that we meet together. May we be built up in love for the glory of your Son and for our blessing in our life together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right.